Maybe Dr. Stenberg would like to react to this because um, you are an expert in um, what what is sometimes called psychoneuroimmunology, and basically. Uh, it's not going at that as far as mystical states, and you don't even have to, you know, really uh, tackle the issues of spirituality in a straightforward way. Even the mention of a, an, uh, an active role of emotions and the way you reflect on your emotions on, uh, on uh, physical health may sometimes be perceived as um, something weird or maybe not that acceptable. What's your opinion on this? This is an excellent question, and I would add to Mario's comments, and I should give a disclaimer, I'm actually from Montreal, and I graduated from McGill University, so mais mon père était professeur à l'Université de Montréal, alors my father was a professor at the University of Montreal, so since this is the United Nations, I'll do my own translation. Um, <laughs> and I should say it is a great honor to speak at the United Nations on September 11th about this issue, which I hope will bring people of all cultures together and realize that we really are made of the same stuff. We are all made of the same biology and perhaps something that transcends it. And, and so I congratulate you and the organizers and the Noor Foundation for putting together this symposium. So I would add not only that there is a difference in the reaction of the scientific community depending upon culture, but also time. So in the area that I study, which is the science of the mind-body connection, the connection between the brain and the immune system, the mind, emotions, and our immune system and health, um, that field was disparaged when I first got into it um, more than uh, 20, 30 years ago, um, my, the chair of my department um, when I was training um, in uh, the United States uh, said, Esther, you're going to ruin your career by doing this. And I um, perversely didn't listen to him because I was convinced by the very point that you made. I was convinced by having seen a patient who had been perfectly well until he was treated with a drug that changed brain serotonin. This drug is not used anymore, but uh, treated with a drug that cha uh, changed brain serotonin, and he developed an autoimmune, scarring, painful uh, disease. And, and that was, to me, such a powerful evidence that you can change the brain and have an immune response or an immune disease as a result that I spent the rest of my career trying to understand the connection between the brain and the immune system. Um, the, the resistance to this notion goes back hundreds of years, really, to Descartes and before, but there are always have been scientists at the edge of discovery who have bucked the dogma and who have courageously set out uh, to address questions that the technologies of their eras could not answer. So for example, uh, in my book I describe the anatomists of Padua, uh, who had, uh, were a, a breakaway group from the University of Bologna, where there was in the 16th century an edict against dissecting the human body uh, by the, the church. And so this group of, of scientists and anatomists moved from Bologna to Padua and set up a hidden amphitheater to dissect the human body, like your hidden emails. And um, they, you can visit that today at the Palazzo del Bo. Um, and, and so they managed to move the frontiers of science beyond where it stood by using the technologies of the day, the best available tools. And, and I think that just because our technologies today cannot answer these very complex questions that you have uh, raised doesn't mean that the uh, phenomena don't exist. But we can only, in scientific terms, take the answers as far as our technologies allow, maintain an open mind. And what I've seen in the 10, 15 years since the technologies have been available in my particular area in understanding the molecules of the immune system and how they can affect the brain so that when you're sick, you feel depressed, your memory uh, is fuzzy, uh, you lose interest in the outside world, and, and so on. We now have the technologies to understand this. We have the technologies to understand how hormones 
uh, from the brain, nerve chemicals from the brain, can affect the immune system and therefore can affect maintaining health or causing disease. We have those technologies, and what I've seen in the last 10 or 15 years is a sea change in the audiences of scientists to whom I speak. 15 years ago, I was afraid to uh, ask the question to a scientific audience, how many of you believe that stress can make you sick? You know, the scientists were stressed, although they didn't, uh, they denied that they were stressed, just to hear that question. And now it's, it's accepted. It's part of the dogma. And why is it? It's because we've been able to prove in the language of science that these phenomena that we all knew for thousands of years are real. We can show the molecules that make you feel sick. We can see the different parts of the brain that are activated when you feel sick. We can see what happens when you inject an immune molecule into the belly and change uh, how the brain functions and so on. That's not to say that that's the only way that we should think. I think it's, it's wonderful to think outside the box. But if you're going to convince a large community of scientists, you need to use the language of science. And, and I have seen it happen. I have seen in this aspect of the field that I study a sea change uh, so that the vast majority of scientists and physicians now accept the notion that the brain and the immune system talk to each other, that stress can make you sick, that believing can make you well, that's a little more on the, the cutting edge and fringe uh, and not fully accepted yet. I won't say fringe, but some scientists think of it that way. But because of the wonderful uh, researchers we have here today and who will be speaking um, this afternoon and research by uh, Mario Beauregard and Andy Newberg, and, um, you know, the evidence is there to help scientists and physicians believe. And then I'm going to say one other point. From my point of view, coming at this as a uh, physician, the wonderful thing about being able to prove to the scientific community and the medical community that these phenomena are real is now there is a groundswell of a movement in clinical medicine bringing these principles into treatment. So what used to be called alternative medical therapies, meditation, prayer, uh, yoga, tai chi, uh, all of these are now called complementary and alternative therapies and actually integrative medicine or blended medicine. And these approaches are now being blended into the conventional armamentarium of care and will, uh, I'm sure, help people to maintain wellness uh, as opposed, and, and in addition to, to fight disease. So there's a very practical outcome to understanding these phenomena.